This is an oral history interview for the Lafayette Historical Society Oral History Project. The date is August 20th, 2015. The time is 4.05, and we are in the History Center room, and the interviewer is Ryan McKinley. So if you could state your name and spell it for the record. Mm -hmm. My name is Mary McCosker, M-A-R-Y. M-C-C-O-S-K-E-R. And when were you born? My birthday is October 27th, 1946. And what were your parents' names? My father was David Stewart, and my mother was June Briskini Stewart. And were they originally from Lafayette, or did they move here? They moved here. Um, my dad grew up in Berkeley, and my mom grew up in San Jose, and they met at Cal, and after they... Um, they were married during the war, and when my my dad was overseas um, until nineteen, early nineteen, I think December of nineteen forty five, and then when he returned, um, they lived in Lafayette in, in a little home that was owned by my great grandfather, but he had also purchased, and I think it's in the thirties. I'm not positive. I could do some research, but he purchased property in Lafayette, a very large amount of property. And it became sort of subdivided, and my dad and my mom bought a piece of land from him. So when I was, I think, one or one and a half, um, we moved into the house that I grew up in, in Lafayette, which was between Highway 24 and Akalani's High School. You said your grandfather had the land. My great-grandfather. And where were they? Were they from Lafayette originally? They were from they? Berkeley. Oh, okay. And they just bought land up here. Right. My great-grandfather was born in Chicago, and then because of someone in the family had health issues, they moved to Ojai, to the desert. But he um, was a professor at Cal and was a, pre was a president at Cal for four years and um, heard about this land that was kind of up from where Pleasant Hill Road is all the way up to the top of the hill, um, going towards Walnut Creek. So not sure of the acreage, but he purchased it. And so several different family members bought property and built. My grandmother lived next door to us as I was growing up. My dad's mother, which who would have been his daughter. And she sold real estate in Orinda. And other family members um, bought or purchased some property. And so we have, uh, there were some, when I was growing up, uh, quite a lot of family around, um, other people too, obviously, because that's a large piece of property. And um, I have a great aunt and uncle who lived in Berkeley, but they built um, sort of a pool, uh, not sort of a pool, they built a pool there. And so, not a home, but just a pool. So the pool is still there, and it, the family, I think her daughter owns it. So we do a lot of family get-togethers at the pool there. So it's just a private... Right, pool just a pool okay. with a big fence around it, and it has a cabana. And they've recently sort of redone the cabana part, so her sons insisted that my cousin put in a dishwasher. And so we do Fourth of July there, and we do Easter there, and other times of the year. So it's real fun. It's a big family thing. Either do you remember your great grandfather talking about what the land was like? I don't remember him talking about the land. Um, he died in, I think I was 10, so I think it was 1956. I can remember there were family get-togethers on a part of that property. Um, I remember there's a, where there's a home today. There was a home he built for his half-sister, and that home is still there near the pool. But next door to it was just a big open lot, and there was a brick, kind of a fireplace there. So we lived across the creek from that piece of property there. And I can remember as a youngster, which meant probably eight or nine or something, I can remember waking up in the morning and going across the creek in my nightgown. Um, and he would make, be making coffee over an open fire where you put water in the pot and add the coffee and it boils. I didn't think I ever had any coffee, but I remember sitting by the fire and being with him. And then on his birthday in June every year, all the great grandchildren would be called. He'd have a on the on the lawn of the house where his half sister lived. He would had a, had a table that he'd sit at, and he had silver dollars. And so he'd ask you where you were going to college, and if you said you were going to Cal, then you got a silver dollar. I can still <laughs> remember that. 
But I remember too, um, on a, I think it was a Sunday in September, and I think we were getting ready to, to drive to San Jose to my grandparents, my mother's parents, for dinner. And I, he had a heart attack. My great-grandfather had a heart attack, and I can remember looking across and seeing him sort of slumped down by a tree, leaning against a tree. And I remember my dad running over there and my dad going to the hospital in the ambulance with him when he died. So uh, some things are really vivid in your mind, even though they're 50 years old. But he was a pretty remarkable gentleman. Once you came up here, what did your mother and father do? My mom was basically a homemaker. She did some tutoring of high school students in French, and she also did some substitute teaching. My dad started off at the high school um, at Akalani's as a history and government teacher, and he coached the swim team. And then in 1959, um, he took a job at the university at Cal, and his job was to, it was called Relations with Schools, and his job was to drive up and down California and visit high schools and talk to students about attending Cal, something they don't have to do anymore. <laughs> they have too many people wanting to go there. Um, and he left Cal in maybe the late 60s and took a job with PG&E and was their educational scholarship person. So he sort of, they have they gave scholarships, so he oversaw that program. And then he retired um, probably shortly after my first child was born. So probably maybe in the late 70s he retired. But he loved, you know, he loved his land, the land that he owned there. He loved, he had fruit trees and we had gardens every year. And he, he really liked that. And he actually always said he was going to retire at 59, and he did. So he and my mom then were able to do a lot of traveling and things like that. What did you? What did he grow in the gardens and fruit trees? Uh, we had apples and apricots and probably peaches and maybe pears. I remember um, the Release Creek runs sort of around our property before it goes under Highway 24. So I can remember in the summertime he'd build these like dikes and things around the fruit trees and then he'd pump water out of the creek and flood the creek or flood the flood the orchards to, to water them and I can remember we we would go in the house and take off all our clothes especially our underwear and put on old cutoffs and a t-shirt and then we would just go and wallow in the mud it was really fun we, we know it was a very idyllic childhood we had chickens he had chickens that laid eggs um, and his, he grew a lot of flowers. My grand, my mother's father um, grew camellias, so we had camellias. But we had, I think we probably had beans in the summer, um, corn probably, tomatoes for sure. Um, but you know, he was really big into growing things. It was fun. And growing up, did you work with him growing things? Or was he- well, all I really remember is the terrible things, but I remember we had walnut trees in the front yard, and I can remember every fall, he'd get these big poles and knock all the walnuts down, and we had to pick them up. <laughs> and I hated that. I hated leaning over and having to pick up all these dumb walnuts. And then he'd dry them on these big wooden trays, and then he'd husk them and crack them and take the nuts out, and then he had bags of of walnuts that he would take then to the walnut growers in Walnut Creek and sell them. So they, my parents were, were fairly thrifty. Um, you know, they, they, Dad, as a high school teacher, didn't make a lot of money, but it was always nice to have him home in the summer because we took we did a lot of camping for vacations because um, it was fun. Dad had been a Boy Scout, so it was really fun and very fairly inexpensive. You know, it was really fun. I can remember the big, huge Hershey's chocolate bars that, not the little ones, but the real thick ones. Mm-hmm. I can remember that was always a big treat when we went camping because we got to have those chocolate bars. Um, and we played lots of, of sport. We played outdoors all the time. I had a friend named Nancy who lived in the neighborhood. We used to ride bikes all over the place, and you didn't have to worry about your kids. You, know, you didn't have to worry about all the things that happen to kids today or that you're leery of. Just remember, we would... 
we had on the hillside across the creek from our house and up the hill behind the pool, um, that whole hillside where Camino Diablo runs today. So I can remember, I had a horse, and my grandmother had a horse, and my cousin had a horse. So we would swim in our bathing suits in the pool for an hour or two. And we'd put on our tennis shoes, we'd go chase the horses into the corral. We'd get on the horses bareback right around the neighborhood, um, and then come back, let the horses go, and go swimming. You know, I was just, I mean, things you wouldn't really let your kids do today. But it was really fun. We had a great, we played basketball. My brother and I played basketball against some neighborhood boys, um, brothers who, they always fought and hogged the ball, so they never beat us because we were always we were always good about sharing the ball. And we played run them down with the tennis ball and make, made my youngest brother be the guy in the middle when we played pickle. But we we were real. We just spent lots and lots and lots of time out of doors. I was a real tomboy, so I played with my brothers a whole lot. And you have two brothers. I have two younger brothers, and they're great guys, even today. Still, we we really get along very well. And do you do you remember much about the neighborhood, or did you come into downtown Lafayette when you were? I don't born? remember. I remember as a child. Before I went to say middle school, I remember they had the big Walnut Festival every year, and there was a big parade down Main Street in Walnut Creek. So I can remember going and standing on the sidewalk and watching those parades. Um, I don't remember really coming into Lafayette until I was in high school, and I had friends who lived kind of off on the other side of the Bart Station. There's Glen Road and Thompson mm -hmm. Road and mm -hmm. South Thompson. I remember riding my bike from home and visiting my friends there. But I don't remember coming into town. But my m mom and dad, when they were first married and lived here, used to walk from the home to the Park Theater down Mount Diablo Boulevard to go to the movies. I, I mean, they told me that they, they did that. So, But the town was really different then, very small and sort of sleepy. And do you know if um, Mount Diablo was... Just the dirt road then, or was it? No, it was. I'm sure paved, oh. but it was probably two lanes, mm -hmm. and you know the cars. And then in the late '40s, I mean, there probably weren't all that many cars. I mean, unless after the war, I, I would imagine people owned cars and trucks here, but not like to the extent. I mean, I think there's a family would have a car, mm -hmm. not now where you have each parent has a car and the kids have a car, and mm -hmm. so. Um, but I've seen, we have pictures here in the history room of the 30s of Mount Diablo Boulevard, and there's two lanes, and you, everybody kind of just pulled off the road, and there weren't parking places like today. Mm -hmm. And um, there were no stoplights, no stop signs. Now it takes forever to mm -hmm. get through Lafayette because it's so crowded and so many places to stop. So, But I don't remember really coming into town. I remember where we shopped. When I was young, over by Manja on Moraga mm -hmm. Road, there was a La Fiesta grocery store, and I can remember, I can remember that going in there with my mom. And then later on, we joined. There was a group of stores, a thing called the Co-op. It was like consumers cooperative, and they had a a store, a grocery store, over on Geary Road. Mm -hmm. And you would give your number when you checked out. So I guess you accrued. I don't know if there was a rebate involved after after a time or but I remember going there with my mom and, and she used to take this neighbor of ours, this older lady who had a wooden leg. She was from Nova Scotia or New Brunswick or somewhere. Just an interesting lady. But I remember going shopping there with my mom. But um and I, I don't I don't even remember where our doctor was, our pediatrician. Probably on doing maybe. I think when you're a, when you're a child, unless it's some big thing uh, event, it's hard to remember. But we, I know all I know is that we wandered a whole lot more than kids do today. Mm. We played outside all the time. Nowadays, everybody has iPads and computers and uh -huh. Wii's and video games, and you know, I, I remember we didn't have a television, but the next door neighbors had one. So I can remember watching Howdy Doody in black and white. And she would, the mom would cut up carrot sticks and celery sticks and olives while we watched. 
I remember the really big thing was we watched the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Mm. And that was really big. It was in black and white, of course, but but it was it was just really amazing, the first TV. I'm sure their quality was really awful. But we could only watch Howdy Doody for a while because the little boy in the family was scared of Clarabelle the Clown, so we had to switch to something else. So, But there wasn't much else to switch to in those days. <laughs> TV was not like it is today. The grocery store you mentioned, do you, was it... Did it just take out where Mangia was, or do you It was think? the whole, bowl. it was that whole, you know, where where Good Earth is, and that whole piece so that there whole was a big, huge, yep, a big, huge store. I don't remember really what it looked like inside or how you got in. I just remember that it was there. I remember being there. I remember once I purloined a pack of gum. And my mom found out when I got home, so she drove back and made me take it back and apologize. So, good way to thwart theft in the future. But, you know, maybe that's why I remember the store, because I remember that event. But there weren't the number of stores. I mean, I don't think there were that many grocery stores in Lafayette. Um, I know at one point that there were like 17 gas stations in Lafayette mm-hmm. one time in the 60s or the 50s. Compared to now, that's a lot. But no, I can't. It's hard to. I I couldn't tell you driving down Mount Table Boulevard what where things were, because I didn't pay attention. I don't think, or maybe I didn't didn't go out as much. Stayed home more. And where did you go to elementary school? Um, when I started school, I started at Montecito, which was there is it used to belong to the school district, and then when the school district downsized in the 70s, um, they sold the property to the mayor group, the mayor group, which uh, it's called the White Pony. Mm. So it's a private school, elementary school now. It's over, um, if you go towards Walnut Creek on 24, and you there's an overpass, El Cortola. It's on the right-hand side of the freeway down there. So I went there, kindergarten, first, second, and third, and then they built Spring Hill School. So it was a brand new school. Um, so I went there fourth, fifth, and sixth, and then I went to Stanley for seventh and eighth because it was an, only a junior high then; it wasn't a middle school. And then I went to Akalani's for four years. What do you remember about Spring Hill being brand new at the time? I remember that it was so new when we first started that they didn't have milk delivery yet, so we couldn't have milk with our lunch. We had to drink water, and I remember that was not my favorite thing. Um, it was really neat to go to a brand new school. It's it's strange because that school was built in, let's see, what would it have been? In the 50s, 56, say? And then I lived here long enough to see the school rebuilt. They tore it all down. When I was on the school board in Lafayette, they tore, we tore it down and rebuilt the whole school as it is today. So it's sort of like it's gone through a whole mm-hmm. cycle. Um, but I remember more about the portables that they had, horrible portables in the rain when they redid it the second time. I remember the playgrounds. They had an upper playground and a lower playground where the field was. The multi-purpose room at Spring Hills where the upper playground was. And girls, of course, had to wear dresses and frou-frou slips, those puffy slips. And I I was very much a tomboy, so I would spend a lot of time playing with the guys, kickball and baseball. But I can remember playing basketball in the upper playground, maybe in fifth grade, and the ball went down the ramp. So I chased it and ran out of my puffy slips. (laughs) But I think I was the only girl, or there was another girl, maybe there were only two of us on the boys' baseball team, and we played other schools in the district, so it was fun. But, you know, girls now, it's so much better. You can wear pants or shorts or whatever. Had to wear stupid dresses that were always so cold in the winter and very impractical to be outside. So um, they didn't have intercoms like we do today. I remember Eleanor Deal was the principal, she was a lovely lady, but very scary because she was very quiet and stern. Sort of your wore a two-piece suit, you know, your sort of prototypical um, principal, I guess. But she was really a really amazing educator. And 
I don't remember. I remember my teachers, but I don't really remember much of the everyday kind of stuff. But it was a, it was a it was a nice school. Do you remember the building layout or anything? Mm-hmm. Was it a single giant building or something? Like that? No, it was a long. Have you seen the Spring Hill today? Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's it was sort of laid out the same way. There was that long corridor that went all the way towards the high school, um, but there wasn't that second story. Um, obviously, the multi-purpose room wasn't there. Uh, so they still had the circular turnaround, I think, and then the kindergarten rooms were maybe over a little to the right of where they are now. Um, I was on traffic patrol in fourth and fifth grade or fifth and sixth grade, and so we wore little hats, we wore sashes, and we had these metal stop signs with wooden handles, and we would march I was a, or no, was I a captain or was I a lieutenant? I can't remember. But we would march out and, you know, somebody would march, we'd march out. We'd actually stop traffic on Pleasant Hill Road, if you can imagine. Nowadays you would get killed doing that. But there wasn't as much traffic, obviously, then. But So we would stop traffic so that people could cross Pleasant Hill Road. Was it as wide then? It might have only been two lanes, I'm not sure. I can remember some kids would be yelling things like, you know, lady, your rods and rods dragging. You know, I mean, people obviously didn't go as fast as they do now. But, um, you know, today, <laughs> you wouldn't want a, anybody out on that road because it's like a major f- freeway thoroughfare. But obviously, um, I mean, there wasn't the volume of traffic. People weren't commuting as many people weren't commuting from Martinez and stuff like that. So it could have only been two lanes. I don't remember. Do you remember any big school activities that you may have done there? Hmm. Assemblies or anything like that? If not, that's okay. No, no. I remember um, I ran for student body office as a sixth grader. Didn't win. But I had a second cousin who went to school there, and so we were going from class to class making little speeches. And she raised her hand when I was in her classroom, and she said, just because she's my cousin, do I have to vote for her? (laughs) And the teacher said, no, of course not. Um, I don't don't really remember. They didn't probably have big stuff like the kids do today, like speakers and things like that. I don't necessarily... I mean, I can't remember anything right this minute. But... um, just remember a lot of sports. Um, I was in a combination, when I was in the sixth grade, I was in a combination of fifth, sixth grade. So that was sort of interesting. Um, but when I was, I remember at Montecito in the third grade, I was horribly disillusioned because we were cleaning the room, classroom for open house when the parents come every spring. And we'd all cleaned our desks and then done all this stuff. And the teacher sort of, I guess, must have been messy. And I remember being horrified when she opened her top desk drawer and just swept everything off the top of her desk into the desk, closed it and locked it. And I just thought that was horrible. (laughs) Maybe type A, neat freak or something. But I remember Mrs. Thompson. I had a man teacher in fourth grade and a man teacher in... Or fifth and sixth, I think I had men teachers. And then I went to Stanley and met some new people. There were a lot more schools feeding into Stanley than there are today. Um, So there were kids from all over Lafayette, but lots more different schools. Um, So I made some really close friends there, friends that I kept through high school, and I still am in touch with now. Not really that, I don't really stay in touch with too many friends from elementary school but definitely friends that I made in junior high or middle school and then on into high school and we still see each other several times a year it's fun one of the mothers of a girl I know is still alive at Rossmore she's like 94 so we always have lunch at her house because it's fun she loves to see all the girls again but it was it was a really idyllic childhood this was a really nice place to grow up 
I'm not so sure anymore. It's just, I don't know, it's a different, everybody's at a faster pace and people have au pairs and they work, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe to, to afford to live here you need two jobs in the family, but the kids just, they aren't, don't seem as self-sufficient. They seem to have parents who hover a lot, but I don't know. It's a nice place still, though. Can't complain. How did you get to school? Did you walk? Did no, you... we had school buses. So we had to walk several blocks to a bus stop. But if you can imagine, we walked two or three blocks, waited for the bus that then took us from Ocalonis Avenue was the street before Stanley Boulevard, and Stanley Boulevard is the one that runs into the high school. So we went from right here <laughs> to Spring Hill. So, you know, buses buses took kids everywhere. I mean, before, I guess they cut the buses at some point because of the cost. But, um, you know, everybody, all the kids rode, rode school buses. So, was, you know, moms didn't have to carpool, and you put the kids on the bus, and then you... Then they walked home after school from the bus stop. It's too bad. I mean, they have bus service now, but it's you have to pay, and it doesn't. You can't have a bus in an area that would compete with AC Transit. So, not every area in Lafayette is has buses that access it. So, it's too bad. And going to Spring Hill, what do you remember about being at Spring Hill Junior High? Oh, Stanley. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Stanley. Um, I remember being feeling really little with some of the I mean it's only two years but when you enter as a seventh grader and you've got really mature eighth graders you feel really I mean I was horribly immature just a goof off (laughs) I mean I had really nice friends but I mean we did silly things I can remember one one fellow in our science class in seventh grade we were all doing the M&M experiment with M and M's to see if they melted in your hands. Mm. I mean, and we, we then you do. I mean, I was we were really silly. I don't. I mean, kids seem much more sophisticated now. Um, I don't think I was particularly mature until I was thirty. <laughs> um, I had an English teacher in high school tell me that I was as subtle as a Mack truck. <laughs> but um, Stanley, Stanley was fun. Um, there was it was the first time that you actually had different teachers for different classes. I can still remember that my eighth grade English and social studies teacher was of Japanese American ancestry from Hawaii, and that was the year that Hawaii became a state. So she was it was really exciting for her. Um, I can kind of remember where the classrooms were located. Um, but it it was fun. It just middle school or junior high is such an awkward time for people, though. Mm-hmm. You know, you're sort of out to lunch. Even today, I see kids. Do you see kids at Stanley now? You see these little boys that are in sixth grade that are little pipsqueaks, and then these voluptuous eighth grade girls <laughs> who look older than I do. <laughs> but um, it's a hard play. It's a hard grade grade levels to teach. I mean, I think it's a really transitional time for kids. And I remember high school as being fun. Um, I mean, I think I think what makes it all palatable is your friends. If you have a nice friends group, a support group, then we went to football games on Friday nights, and then there were dances, and um, it was fun. I don't think I I don't think I appreciated it. I don't know how it is for other kids, but I don't think I really appreciated growing up here until until you know later on when I had my kids here. Saw them grow up here. It's a nice place. And when you were at Stanley in Akalani, that was in the 1960s? Uh huh. I graduated in 64. So um, I can remember the Beatles. When I was a, I think I was a junior or a senior, the Beatles were just starting to be really big. Um, I can remember doing a rally committee skit, being one of the Beatles. Um, the Beach Boys. I mean, there was really, I mean, there was lots and lots of music. There were hoot nannies. All the folk music was really big then, too. Um, I took two languages in high school. I took French, four years of French, and then I took three years of Russian, because, of course, that was the Cold War era, and 
So it was going to pay off to know Russian, right? But the man who was our teacher in Russian also taught German, and he was very fluent in many languages. But he'd actually been in the Russian embassy. He'd worked there. So not only did we learn the you know, everyday language and stuff. But he taught us lots of good stuff like swear words, <laughs> things, practical things. So I'm not sure I could say much in Russian anymore, but I could call you a SOB. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny things you remember. But I was not a science and math person, nor am I now. And uh, I can remember a, lo- a boy who lives, who lived in the neighborhood I live in now was a year behind me, so he was accelerated. He was so smart and was in in chemistry with me. And we had a chemistry teacher who had been at Akalani since it opened in 1945, I think. Miss Nick. And, you know, she she was a great teacher. I just didn't get it. So if I hadn't had this young man, Bob, as my lab partner, I probably would have grossly failed chemistry. He ma- he managed to explain things to me. And, and uh, you know, it was... But it was fun. I, I think everybody thinks, at least they did in that time period, I think kids are much more sophisticated now. But I think that everybody thinks they're all sort of different and weird. And I mean, you know, it's a, those years are really hard. Those. The other thing that high school didn't have that I probably really would have benefited from um, that they have now is sports for girls. There was, there was, you when you played basketball, they had a basketball court, but there were squares, and you couldn't go out of your square. So you, somebody would throw you the mm. ball, and you'd stand in your square, and you'd throw to someone. I mean, you weren't. There wasn't that movement that you have today. Mm. I guess because girls weren't, you know, physically able to do that, right? Um, so when I went to Cal, um, I played collegiate basketball for four or five years. Um, it's re- it was a really neat thing. There really wasn't a lot for girls to do, except go to the football games and cheer. And other than that, so that's one thing that I think has changed for the better. There's more opportunities for young girls to to do sports, especially. Did they have extracurricular cl- clubs or things like that for girls? Or did they when I was there? Yeah, they had a GAA Girls Athletic Association, but I don't remember them doing much of anything. There wasn't swimming for girls, there wasn't basketball or softball or there might have been tennis. Uh, I don't know. But there really wasn't any kind of organized sports whereas now girls play lacrosse, Mm -hmm. girls play soccer, girls do everything the guys do pretty much, except for wrestling maybe. But, you know, there wasn't a lot for girls to do aside from just going to school and it's too Mm -hmm. bad. I'm glad that it's changed because I think it opens up opportunities for you know girls to have act, physical activity too and do you being in high school in the 60s do you remember a lot of the kind of tumultuous the president kennedy assassination oh things like yeah that? i do i do um i remember i was telling someone the other day our parent my parents generation the, the seminal event was you know pearl harbor and for my generation it was jfk and for my kids it was 9 11 but I was, it was on a Friday, and I was in my fourth period English class right before lunch at Akalani's. And I can remember someone coming in and saying something to the teacher. And so at that point, they sort of, it was lunchtime and everyone was wandering around. I remember my brother, who was two years behind me in school, yeah, he and another boy went out and lowered the flag to half staff. Um, and then we, I think we were sent home. I think we went home early. And then there was Saturday, and then I remember on Sunday morning we were watching television, and we saw Lee Harvey Oswald shot um, by Jack Ruby. I mean, it was live. It was just really, and then the funeral and all, it was really, 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 I mean, it really, because television wasn't that, was relatively new still. But just to see that black and white television, see all that happening live. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you know, everything's on Internet and Twitter and... Mm -hmm. You get a Facebook message immediately, but that was really, that was really. And then then I left Lafayette and went to Berkeley, and my first semester at Cal was the free speech movement with the police and the tear gas and the arrests, and, and that was really 
wild too. I mean, you know, talk about coming from a more sheltered environment and then all of a sudden you're in the middle of that. So it was really interesting. Cal was the ground zero for all of the protests that, you know, with the war and all. It was really, really different and then very different from my, my growing up here. Even though it's such a close geographical place, it's just a whole different world. It was very interesting. And after Cal, did you immediately move back to Lafayette? No, I was in the Peace Corps in the Philippines. And then when I came back, I, got, I had received my teaching credential prior to going to the, in the Peace Corps. So I had a friend in, who was teaching in Moraga. So I got a job at Donald Ream School in Moraga. And I taught there for seven years. I, got, I came, started teaching in seven, early 70s. Got married in 74, and then had my first child in 77. So I took a year's leave from teaching, thinking I'd come back, and never did. So I had three kids, but I was involved in, they were, it went to a cooperative nursery school here in Lafayette. So I was involved in that for seven years. And then I was on the school board in Lafayette for 13 years. Um, so we've lived here since 1974. So... 40 years, more than 40 years. So uh, there's been a lot of big changes in the town. Just the traffic is just unbelievable. <laughs> and now there's so much growth going on. The mm-hmm. building and the condos going up everywhere. And We live up the hill from Celia's. You know where Celia's is in mm-hmm. Lafayette? So they're going to take that whole area, Celia's and all out, and they have a big development going in there, supposedly. There's a lot of finagling and wrangling about access, egress, and you know, where they're going to put it, because the neighborhood doesn't want it on that little Dolores, because, you know, it's just a very narrow street. So we're trying to get it on to Pleasant, or to Mount Diablo Boulevard. But the, the city has, you know, it's really, really, really changed. Now, across from Akalani's, on mm-hmm. that hill, they're going to build, they were going to put in 300 plus apartments, but now they're, that was a big brouhaha about that, but now they're going to do 40 homes and a soccer field and a dog run, dog park. So, I don't know, at some point it's like, is this and this and this enough? Because it's just, it's getting crazy to try to drive around in here. I don't know if you ever drive around in Lafayette sometimes. <laughs> I mean, Moraga yeah. isn't quite as impacted, because if you're going to Moraga, you're just going there. Mm-hmm. Um, but Lafayette seems to be sort of on the way. I don't know, it's crazy. But maybe I'm just getting old. <laughs> So you left in 1964 to go to Cal. Uh-huh. Did, did you come back like for summers and things like that? Oh, yeah, like that? yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I worked up at the... Cal has an alumni camp up in the... up in the... near Sonora. So I worked there three summers. My parents lived in the house where I grew up until probably the early 1990s can't remember the year exactly. Then they moved to Rossmore. Hmm. And so they spent, I think, 12 to 14 years there. They died five years ago within about four months of each other, which was, you know, but it's weird. I mean, when you're not the child anymore and you're the Hmm. oldest one. So most of my life I've been here, aside from college when I would, you know, I'd be around. Can you tell me a little bit more about your time on the school board? Yeah. Um... I can't really tell you the year I was elected. <laughs> I could figure it out. Um, when my oldest daughter was one, which would have been like 1978, um, a friend from college was teaching at Happy Valley School. and Or she had been teaching at Happy Valley School, and she had had twin girls the year before I had Kate. And there was a... Um, program called Early Childhood Education. It was a state-funded program. And so they sort of needed a coordinator, and you kept records, and you hired A's for the classrooms and things like that. So we job-shared that. And one day a week, we'd work three days a week. So one day, I'd take my kids to her house, and I'd work. And another day, I'd take her girls, and she'd work. And then one day, we had an older lady who would take care of all the kids. So we did that... Wow, probably 10 years maybe, maybe not that much. And 
Then she took a job as a classroom aide at Happy Valley. So I continued on by myself with that job. And then she went back into the classroom. Um, she job shared for a long time. She just retired this last year. Um, and we were paid like, I think I was paid $2,000 a year for for doing that, which was great. But I decided that, I don't know, I just decided that I would was interested in being on the school board. So I ran, and I was elected, and I was elected, re-elected two more times, but then they were trying to get the, because they were four-year terms, they were trying to get things synchronized or something, so I stayed on an extra year, which made the thirteen. So I think I went off in around 2000, maybe. But it was interesting because the district had downsized. The enrollment of the district went down. So before there was Montecito School, Vallecito is where Bentley School is today. That was an elementary school. Then they built Happy Valley and Spring Hill in the 50s. And then there was, do you know where the community center is? Mm -hmm. That was Burton School, just plain Burton School. And then where Burton Valley is, which is a little farther along St. Mary's, that was Marywood Elementary and another middle school called Fairview at the same site. And then they had built Ellis School, which was across from Spring Hill, kind of across the street back in there, which it's gone too. So then they were they had downsized, and um, so I think they had they closed Vallecito, they closed Montecito, they closed Ellis, they closed Burton, they got rid of a middle school, so they just had Stanley. Now that now the district's enrollment is seemingly creeping up, so it's sort of hard. You have to plan ahead because otherwise class size gets huge, and a lot of schools don't have the the facilities to have extra classrooms, you know. So it's it's really hard because it's very expensive to reopen a school. I don't I don't think there's a school you could reopen because Valcido is sold. Montecito would be the only one, but it is in such you know, it was built in fifty six, so you probably have to raise it and totally build a new school and is that economically feasible. So you know, it wasn't it wasn't a time of huge crisis. I mean, we were lucky to have a superintendent who was here for many years. And then when he retired, he was replaced with a fabulous man named John Frank, who, who did a wonderful job. He was really a people person. The other fellow was more of a financial person. Um, and then they had a series of sort of not-so-great ones. And now they have a Rachel Zinn is the superintendent now, and she's fabulous. Um, but education has really changed. Now there's a home there's I don't know there's a lot more prescripted stuff coming from the federal government and the state um, and I think sometimes in education one size doesn't fit all so a lot of school districts like Moraga and Orinda and Lafayette who probably do a really really good job without intervention I mean those te- they hire good teachers teachers tend to stay they're bright well educated but I think a lot, sometimes these teachers today, uh, there's not time for individual creativity anymore. So it's a definitely a harder time to be on the school board, really hard. But um, it was a really enjoyable time. I really enjoyed doing it. And what was being on the school board like, like a month-to-month kind of thing? Well, yeah. There were always lots of meetings. I mean, we met once a month um, in a formal setting. But you were, you did, you know, you worked, Maybe it wasn't something official, but you know, you spent time on a campus and you talked to teachers, and um, you were on, you were involved because you're on the school board. That meant that you did other things related to that. So it was it was a busy time. Um, I don't remember it being oppressive. Um, my husband had a software company, and he was gone a lot of the time. I mean, he traveled a lot, um, but I don't remember it being really difficult. Um, but 
I mean, I think it was just being out and about. And because you're on the school board, then you were on other committees and things, and so you tended to um, go to other meetings. But I don't know if it's... I mean, I think the issues they're dealing with now are a lot bigger than what we did, but... You know, it was a good time. I mean, it was. A, it, I think that we did a lot of good things. We had good people who were on the board with me too, and I think that's important. It just takes one person with different kinds of ideas that doesn't work well, and it kind of throws everybody for a loop. So, and it's hard to find people who want to put in that kind of time. It's a lot of time sometimes. And were you on the board when they rebuilt Spring Hill? Uh huh. And Lafayette. Or parts of Lafayette, they added on to Lafayette. Yeah, so, you know, those were big decisions. And what to do with the school like Spring Hill, they totally tore the whole thing down. So they had portables. And Lafayette out on that field, I can remember trying to get to the office in the pouring rain. You know, it wasn't a great year or so. But it really, you know, we, we it, John Frank really got the facilities in the district up to speed. They did renovations or total remodels on every school in the district. They added the big, um, they redid the multi-purpose room at Stanley. Um, they added new classrooms. They did some portables that were permanent kind of portables that were nice. Um, you know, I well, someday I should count how many school board meetings that was. It's hard to remember now. You know, it's been over... 15 years, I think, since maybe more than that. Is there anything you really miss about the way Lafayette used to be? I think I think it would be nice if, I mean, it's, it's probably true in some neighborhoods still, but um, it was always nice to have, you know, where kids could wander around. I mean, nowadays everybody is so scared because there's strange people out there. But just for kids to not be so, they have such structured lives. After school, you go to soccer, and then you have a tutor, and then you do this and you do that, because otherwise you're not going to get into Stanford or whatever. I mean, I think kids aren't allowed to be kids as much. And I don't know if that's just because there's such a, you know, maybe it's the communication, it's all the information age that we live in, and there's so much more out there. Um, I wish there wasn't as much, traffic in Lafayette. I wish it was a little more rural and but everybody wants all the fancy stuff and um, I don't know, I just think it sort of lost a little of its of its charm because it's suburban, but I guess there's nothing you could probably do about that. I mean, I don't think I would have wanted to live in pioneer times here when you had an outhouse and a, <laughs> but so there you take the good with the bad. And where do you see Lafayette heading in the future, or hope it's heading in the future, if if anywhere? Well, I hope there's people who are still interested in making the community be a better place. So that's volunteerism, people who, who want to volunteer at the bookshop or volunteer at the history room or for some other group in the city, the Creeks Commission. or I mean, we do have a lot of people who volunteer a lot of their time. Um, I think, I hope that the schools continue to be good because I think that affects the whole community. People move here. They want to live here because the schools are good. Um, I hope it doesn't get any more populated if we could do something like that. I mean, I, we're going to have more people moving in because they're doing all this building. Um, but I guess just that it retains a little bit of its rural charm. Um, I don't want to be a big city. I like just that life was a little simpler, but I don't see it heading that direction. I see it going the other way because everybody always wants bigger and better. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Interview ends at 5.05.